Thanks very much, Meredith. Well, our last speaker this afternoon is Antonio Convite, who is Deputy Director of the Nathan Klein Institute and Professor of Psychiatry, Medicine, and Radiology at the NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Convite's work focuses on the understanding of the impact of obesity-mediated metabolic disease on the brain. He will speak on the topic of toxic stress and its role in childhood obesity. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll try and hold up the tail here. Um, so what, I'm not really going to talk about stress per se very much. I'm going to talk about the toxic effects of overnutrition on brain. Um, so obesity and brain function in adolescents, it, it's not really mediated by BMI. It's really mediated by what happens as a result of, BDM, of BMI. So much like John uh, Carl suggested earlier that we're so obsessed with size, we really should be really thinking much more about metabolic dysregulation because that certainly is what has the biggest impact on brain. This is uh, just a little data uh, to show you, uh, there are four panels here for different cognitive functions, but there are four groups of kids. Uh, lean is the leftmost, obese kids without marked insulin resistance, then obese kids with insulin resistance, and then kids with type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, there is a step-down uh, function of uh, uh, cognitive performance. Um, so adolescents with uh, metabolic uh, dysregulation, they demonstrate clear uh, uh, brain abnormalities. So we use slightly modified criteria for how we define metabolic syndrome, uh, because in kids, by the time a kid has impaired fasting glucose, that horse is already out of the barn. So there are few kids that have uh, uh, impairment in, in metabolic regulation that have abnormal glucose levels. So we used uh, a more sensitive measure of insulin uh, resistance. And for this, we use the Quickie, which is it's very similar to the HOMA, but of insulin sensitivity. So we looked at a group of a little over 100 kids. And I show you this here because uh, look at the right side, the right column, which are the kids that are the control kids. So they're not a squeaky clean control group. It's a group that does not fulfill three out of the five criteria, but they may have one or two. So it's a really a real world comparison group. Uh, and we looked at a whole bunch of cognitive domains, and we found that there are many cognitive domains that are impacted uh, by metabolic dysregulation, by metabolic syndrome in kids. I suppose if you look at adults with type 2 diabetes, adults with type 2 diabetes have predominantly attention and memory dysfunction. They don't have psychomotor efficiency. They don't have executive function. Uh, and they don't have things of daily living, like academic achievement. Kids are much more impaired when they're under metabolic dysregulation than adults are. So when we looked at the number of criteria of metabolic syndrome that the kids met, uh, we found that there was a decreasing performance. So for kids on the left uh, of each of these graphs that have zero of the five criteria, those were the kids who were performing best. The kids who had more, four or more of the criteria were performing uh, the worst. The bottom uh, two panels are time tasks, so uh, the higher the number, the worse the performance. So we were interested in, well, what, what's happening in the brain? So one of the things that we were interested in seeing is uh, the white matter serves as a connector of everywhere in the brain. So we were interested in ascertaining the integrity of the white matter. And you can do that on the MRI uh, very uh, non-invasively. So you can use what is called diffuser tensor imaging. And let me just give you a two-second review of what that is. So if you have a water molecule and a huge fat of water, it can move in all directions equally. That's called isotropic diffusion. If you constrain the movement of water, as in the pipe up at the top, the water will move preferentially along the long axis of the pipe. Well, axons are basically pipes. And they happen to be covered by myelin. So you constrain the movement of water orthogonal to the long axis of the, of the axon. So, and that's called anisotropic diffusion. So you can measure that in the magnet, and you can come up with a map of anisotropy. 
So on the top, you have a kid who has metabolic syndrome, and on the bottom, a kid who is a control. There are three colors in the fractional anisotropy maps that you can see there. The red is where the fibers are most compact, which is in the corpus callosum, internal capsule, and so forth, and that's why it's shown in red, because it has a lot of fractional anisotropies. The water is very constrained. The yellow is the rest of the white matter that's not so tightly packed, but as you can see, that constrains the movement of water much more than the green, which is where the CSF and the neurons are, the gray matter, because there you only have the membranes to actually uh, prevent the water from moving freely. So we can do fancy analysis, and uh, you're a sophisticated audience here in terms of uh, statistics because of the kind of work that you do. So we uh, can create a, a group image for the kids who are in the control group and a group image for fractional anisotropy for the kids who are in the metabolic syndrome group. And then we can contrast voxel by voxel, little volume of that brain by little volume of the brain. Obviously, it's gazillions of comparisons, but we constrain that those comparisons by having a very low false discovery rate. And if we find one voxel that differentiates the two groups, you have to have 100 contiguous voxels that are in the same direction also significant. So that's the way we do very conservative statistics. And what we found in this little Cena loop here are the areas where the kids with metabolic syndrome had abnormality relative to the kids in the control group. Now, there's no constraint on this analysis. So if the kids with metabolic syndrome were healthier, you would see blobs in orange or, or yellow. And as you can see, there are none. So the kids with metabolic syndrome are worse off in every single thing, in every single of those blobs that are in the brain. And it's a large volume of blobs. It's, it's almost five cc's, which is a huge volume when you're considering the size of the white matter. We also measured the hippocampal volumes, and we measured the amount of water that's in those kids' brains. And what we found was that the hippocampal volume in kids who have metabolic syndrome is already reduced relative to the control kids. So that's been described in kids with type 2 diabetes, and we published that a long time ago. And it's known in adults with type 2 diabetes. But in kids who are pre-diabetic, they already have hippocampal volume reduction, and they already have more brain atrophy. Uh, than the kids who don't have uh, metabolic syndrome. And you know, not all the factors that go into making up the metabolic uh, syndrome uh, are equal. So if we throw them all into a pot, the only one that survives in explaining the brain in a multivariate setting is insulin resistance. The kids don't care about cholesterol, they don't care about blood pressure, they don't care about anything else. So obviously if they have horrible blood pressure, that's gonna be a problem but insulin resistance is really the driver here. And these are two uh, uh, graphs showing you uh, the, the x-axis is the quickie score. So the higher that value, the more insulin sensitive that kid is. And on uh, the y-axis are either the intracranial vault adjusted volume of the hippocampus, because obviously we have boys and girls, so we have to control for the intracranial vault size. And as you can see, there is more on the right side that's uh, global atrophy. So the higher the insulin sensitivity, the less uh, water there is in that brain. And on the left panel, the more insulin sensitive the kid is, so the, to the right, the bigger the hippocampal size. OK, so what could be the mechanisms for this? Um, obviously, the mechanisms are going to be very complex. And we look at a whole bunch of stuff. But I'm only going to focus on one little thing today which is microvascular problems, so vascular reactivity. Um, and others have hinted at that today in the placenta and so forth. Um, so I'm going to use a simple model. So the reason why we're focusing uh, on microvascular dysfunction or on vascular reactivity is because when you're trying to get out of the house and you can't find your keys, uh, and you're struggling to find your keys, those parts of the brain that are trying to help you find those keys are, get activated. And when a part of the brain gets activated, it uses glucose extremely avidly. We know from microdialysis experiments in animals that there are glucose dips, interstitial glucose dips of about 30%. So the glucose transporter, the blood-brain barrier, has a low KM. So that means it's fully saturated at normal glucose levels. So it can't move any faster to get you more juice 
to those parts of the brain that need it. So you need to relax the capillary bed to expose new glucose transporters, and then they can help you shuttle more glucose into those parts of the brain that need it because the brain only uses glucose as its primary metabolic uh, source. So we know that in insulin resistance, there's endothelial dysfunction, and that the ability to relax the capillary bed under demand is compromised, and that's related to perhaps inflammation. It's related directly to insulin resistance, uh, and there may be a whole bunch of other things. Um, so one of the ways that you can look in kids uh, completely non-invasively is to look at the retinas of these kids. So you can have a kid sit in a dimly lit room, and then you flash a picture of their eye after the pupil dilates in the dimly lit room, and then you can measure the retinal vessels. The reason why we like the retinal vessels is because, number one, they come developmentally from very much the same place as the cerebral microvasculature, and they're controlled by very similar physiology. Uh, so this is what a, a shot looks like. And you know we filter it so that we can get better resolution, better contrast, and then we can make measurements of both the veins, in this case, and the arteries. We measure them all over the retina, and then we use fancy formulas, and we do it reliably. And then what we find is that if you're going to predict the size of the artery, the bigger the artery in the retina, the arterial, that means healthier. So it gets reduced by high blood pressure. It gets reduced by dyslipidemia. It gets reduced by a whole bunch of things. But it gets reduced. So here we control for mean blood pressure, for the age of the kid, for sleep apnea. And that explains about 9% of the variance. Now we have boys and girls here, and they're big and small kids. So obviously we want to control for the vessel size. So we control for the size of the venule in the retina. And that explains a big portion of the variance, 33%. Because, of course, veins and arteries are similar in size. But when you put in the size of the kid, the BMI, and a measure of insulin resistance, you explain an additional 20% in the size of the arterial or the arterial. Uh, so this potentially is a very non-invasive, easy to obtain, cheap uh, biomarker. So, we have corroborated this by doing fancier things that we can do in the MRI that I'm not going to show you today. So we uh, get kids in the MRI, and we have them rebreathe some of their same air. So we increase their entitled CO2, and that causes a huge vascular response in the brain. And we know that in kids who have insulin resistance, their amount of the vascular response, the cerebral vascular response, is blunted. So, and that's directly associated to insulin resistance. That's been done with transcranial Doppler, and that's been done with all sorts of methods, but we can do it in the MRI, uh, uh, in the hippocampus, and in other parts. So uh, I wanted to move now to, uh, you know, I'm always talking about bad news. I'm always talking about horrible things that happens to kids' brains. So uh, uh, Sherry had suggested that maybe we try and link this to something that can be done in the community, some uh, public health handle. So there are two uh, easy public health handles. Uh, one is fitness and one is sleep, and I'm going to show you a little bit of our work on that. This here is a map of physical inactivity. And for those of you who have seen those obesity maps ad nauseum, that tells you that this map is very similar to the map of obesity and or type 2 diabetes. So this is individuals who don't do anything. They don't golf. They don't garden. They don't do any brisk walking, nothing. So physical inactivity is defined as basically somebody who sits on a couch most of the time and who drives everywhere. Uh, now, in the real world, uh, obesity and, well, so this here is a, a group of our kids in the lab where we measure their fitness, their, uh, uh, and we relate that to their waist height ratio because it's not just how much excess weight you carry, but where, where you carry it. And as you can see, this, is, this almost looks like I made up this data, but I didn't. So, uh, so we explain 85% of the variance here. So uh, as you can see, there's a very tight relationship between the waist height ratio in the kid and how fit that kid is. But more importantly, uh, when you plot how insulin sensitive that kid is, it's directly related to the level of fitness. And we get the exact same results if we do fancy uh, uh, insulin sensitivity assessments with dynamic assessments by doing 
insulin modified frequently sample IBGTPs, but I won't bore you with all the details. This, so no matter what measure of insulin sensitivity we use, we get the exact same measures. Um, so what happens when we cut budgets in school? Well, we cut two things. We cut gym and we cut art. So, and the problem is that uh, we, because we want to invest in more quote unquote academic time. So the problem is that this is a study that was done by the health department and the Department of Education in New York City. They looked at 550,000 kids. So it's, you know, it's very bad data, but 550,000 make up for a lot of sins in the data. And what they looked at was the BMI of the kids. And in New York City, they do what's called the fitness gram. So they have the kids run up and down and do push-ups and so forth. And they come up with a score of how fit the kid is. Well, as anticipated, of course, the kids who had the largest BMIs were less fit than the kids who had the lower BMIs. But, and, and, and this is what was very positive about the way they sold this. this. This article, hardly anybody knows about it. But what, when they looked at the top third of the kids by fitness and compared them to the bottom third, there were statistically significant uh, differences in grades, but more importantly, in standardized state exams and regents exams that all the kids had to take the exact same exam. When they looked at the top 5% and compared it to the bottom 5%, they differed by 36 percentile points on the regents exams. That's the difference between an A and a D. Granted, that, those are the very extremes of the distribution. And some of the kids that are very, very unfit, they may be uh, you know, physically, they may have other illnesses, they may have asthma, who knows what they could have that contributes to them being unfit. But the, the issue is that there are a lot of kids here and fitness is key for academic performance. The other thing that we can try and do something about is sleep. So I can manipulate the sleep of a healthy athletic individual and have that individual in a matter of a week become insulin resistant. So I can put you in the sleep lab and every time you start going into slow wave sleep, which is the recuperative sleep, uh, uh, and that only happens in the first three or four hours of the night. Uh, this is a cycle here of, uh, of a, so at the leftmost, where you have the bigger dips, that's the recuperative sleep. So that's the slow wave sleep. If I disrupt that slow wave sleep, I can actually make you insulin resistant. So kids are very bad sleepers. When you get into adolescence, you don't want to be asleep at all. So we actually do sleep studies at home and then relate them to very detailed sleep studies that we do in the lab. And what we find is that when you look at the respiratory disturbance index, which is the number of times that the kid wakes up or the number of times that the kid has an apneic or a hypopneic episode, uh, that tells you how disrupted that kid's sleep is. That's highly related to the amount of slow wave sleep. Now, slow wave sleep is very important for cleaning toxins out of the brain. There was a, a, an animal study that just came out showing that uh, you open up a new uh, type of uh, uh, system for uh, getting toxins out of the brain that we didn't even know existed. Uh, and uh, so slow wave sleep is extremely important. Uh, but when you look at slow wave sleep and how it relates to insulin sensitivity, the more slow wave sleep that the kids have, the more insulin sensitive they are. This is all in the same group of obese kids. And when you look on the right side for a measure of, of inflammation, the more uh, slow wave sleep the, ki the kid has, the less uh, inflammation they have. Granted, this is an acute reactant, so it's different than what we've been talking about today, but CRP, C-reactive protein, but nevertheless, it it's important. So what I wanted was to summarize what I spoke about. The, there are clear abnormalities that are associated with obesity and insulin resistance. The brain abnormalities appear to be driven by insulin resistance. Uh, and one of the potential effectors may be impaired vascular reactivity, cerebral vascular reactivity. Uh, we may be able to use something as simple as an arteriolar uh, uh, retinal arteriolar measure 
as a biomarker for field trials and other things where we don't want to be invasive. And that fitness and sleep quality are certainly two things that we can do today to incentivize kids to stay healthier. So, uh, so this is a group of uh, individuals who I collaborate with. The sleep studies uh, are being done in conjunction with Ricardo Osorio. Uh, and most of the brain work that I showed you uh, was done by Pula Yao, uh, who's now assistant professor. She was a postdoc in my lab. And the retinal work was mostly done by Aziz Tirsi. Thank you very much.